This is the Comics Alternative Manga, reviews of Captain Harlock Classic Collection, Volume 1, and Slumwolf. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Manga. I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. And we're two scholars who enjoy discussing manga. And on the August manga show, we're going to be looking at two really interesting works. We're going to begin with Liiji Matsumoto's Captain Harlock Classic Collection, Volume 1. And then after that, we're going to look at Slum Wolf by Tadeo Tsugi. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Manga is brought to you by those wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that go higher than that. Like this month, you can get uh, some of these manga classic, these classic adapt- adaptations of novels like Scarlet Letter or Emma or Pride and Prejudice for 25% off. Yeah, and those are really interesting. I've read a number of them, including the one for Scarlet Letter. Those come out from, I think, Udon? Yes. Yes. Uh, y- you know, whatever kind of manga you enjoy, whether it be adaptation, science fiction, uh, slice of life, or whatnot, you can't go wrong with the good folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs and manga pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your text there, be sure to send them an email and tell them that Shay and Derek sent you. Mm-hmm. Well, Shay, school has started. How have things been going for you? They have been going pretty well. Um, this semester, I am teaching a class for the very first time. And um, so that's been a, a new experience and uh, exciting and fun and uh, a little nerve wracking. But um, <laughs> it's it's been it's been it's it's a, gotten off to a pretty good start, I would say. Well, that's good. I um, I remember when I first started to teach as a graduate student, it was both intimidating and also <laughs> thrilling at the same time. Yes, I think that is a good good way to describe the experience. <laughs> and maybe someday you'll be able to teach a course in manga. That's true. And speaking of manga, let's go ahead and get started with this month's discussion. And we're going to begin with Captain Harlock Classic Collection, Volume 1. This is by Liji Matsumoto, and it's coming out, or it came out, back in June from Seven Seas Entertainment. Uh, And in fact, Seven Seas has been doing a number of these classic collections. Either they already are out or they plan to be out. So uh, this is, uh, I think, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I've been really impressed recently that um, Seven Seas, which uh, I think before last year wasn't a publisher that I it was kind of on my radar too much, but recently they've been releasing these great editions of, um, you know, Captain Harlock, which we'll be talking about today. They've got um, a number of uh, Go Nagai books, including Devil Man and um, Cutie Honey. Oh, that's right. Um, and then uh, I think there were a couple other of those of those classic '60s and '70s um, sci-fi and, and fantasy manga that they were they were bringing out. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure what happened, uh, what changed behind the scenes, but um, 
yeah, their the recent publishing slate has been been really really impressive. Yeah, and I know that it was a rarity that we had discussed a Seven Seas text in the past, but lately we've been doing more of their books, <laughs> and mm-hmm. in fact, um, I think the last two manga episodes we discussed a book published by Seven Seas. There was you know Claudine, and then last mm-hmm. month my Solo Exchange Diary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's. Uh... I think it's a really good year for them, and I'm, I've been really excited by uh, by the stuff they've been putting out. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when it comes to Captain Harlock, I mean, this is a, I guess you could call it a classic manga. Um, it was originally published between 1977 and 1979. I mean, there's older manga that's even, I guess, mm-hmm. more classic if you want to look at it that way. Uh, but this is something that I had heard about, but I had never read. Now, before this classic collection from Seven Seas, had you read any Captain Harlock or seen any of the um, anime? You know, I've, I haven't, uh, either seen the anime or, or read the manga, um, you know, uh, we covered, uh, I think last year or, or maybe even the year before, um, time kind of gets away from me with these, with these episodes. But, um, a while back we talked about, um, another Matsumoto title, um, Queen Emeraldus, That's which right. uh, I believe Seven Seas also put out, mm-hmm. uh, which is sort of a related series to Captain Harlock. And I know when we talked about that, we, we talked briefly about how for, uh, a really long time, Matsumoto's work was almost completely unavailable um, in English translation. So Harlock was, and I think this is, is has a lot to do with the with the anime. But for a good while, Harlock was one of those series that I had heard so much about. I had heard how influential it was, and um, Matsumoto's uh, name was was one that I kept seeing again and again and again. Um, but I just had never gotten the opportunity to. Um, to actually read um, any of these comics before now, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's good to see that they are that Seven Seas is kind of investing in in, in getting these um, older series that um, people like us have have heard so much about, and uh, now we finally get an opportunity to to read them for ourselves. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, so if yeah, I have to say, you said this is your first exposure. This is my first exposure to Captain Harlock. So I'm curious what your reaction is to this first um, volume in the classic collection. You know, um, I think my reaction would be a little bit different if, you know, like like I said, said we, we talked about a sort of related work to this, the Queen of Emeraldus, um, on an earlier episode. And if I hadn't read that, I think I would have had a, a different reaction, but, um, yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed this quite a bit. Um, you know, I think it, there are parts of it that, that I think are, are definitely products of, you know, the fact that it was the, the late seventies and, um, the kind of conventions of manga and comics, um, and narrative were, were different than they are, um, today. But, um, I, I found myself really liking it. I like um, Matsumoto's. I like that we we are constantly reminded that Matsumoto is capable of drawing with um, this incredible amount of, of detail and complexity and fidelity to um, to reality. And he's got this really fantastic sense of design when it comes to designing these these spaceships. Oh, definitely, um, yeah. But he he often draws these very, very stylized, uh, very expressive, very cartoonish um, figures. And the juxtaposition of that, the the kind of detail of the backgrounds and the things like the spaceship and the environments with this um, very abstracted, very goofy almost um, figure work uh, is, is, is something I, I really enjoyed. It's something I really enjoyed in when we talked about Queen, Queen Emeraldus, but I think it was was even uh, uh, more pronounced here. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've been talking about uh, Queen Emerald, uh, uh, Emeraldus. Um, she actually does appear, mm-hmm. uh, or the figure in one form or another does appear in this collection a couple of times. And I went back and looked, and it's been almost exactly two years ago that we discussed mm. that uh, Queen Emeraldus volume. 
Yeah, see, I thought it was was last year. These when you do so many of these <laughs> shows, they they get away from you. Yeah, but... T- tell me about it. Yeah, I, I definitely can <laughs> can understand that. Um, you know, I, I I get what you're saying about the juxtaposition of the highly detailed setting and sometimes characters. I think that Captain Harlock himself is mm-hmm. represented in a very serious. Same thing mm-hmm. with Tadashi. You know, another main character. Um, they're represented as serious, realistic uh, figures that I think kind of meld in well with the highly detailed, realistic settings, the spaceship and whatnot that we get here. But at the same time, we do get some of these cartoonish figures. And I was thinking in particular of some characters who actually serve as comic relief. And I think that's how or why he uses... Uh, why Matsumoto uses some of these cartoonish characters because it does provide comic relief. Uh, there's the first mate, Yatarian, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Zero, and then the cook, Miss Masu. Uh, and all of them are just drawn in this really weird, cartoonish, over the top way. And in fact, their behavior uh, it goes hand in hand with the way that they're drawn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, a great example of that is, uh, oh, I believe the he's the president of, of Japan, um, who... Oh, the prime uh, minister. The prime minister, um, who the first f- few um, chapters um, or serials um, in this first volume, at least, um, open with him kind of being interrupted uh, uh, by an aide who's bringing him news of an alien invasion and his response is to like kind of curl up under the his his um his blanket and complain about how his kind of beauty rest has been disturbed and how all he wants to do is is play golf um (laughs) and and he's he's drawn in this very uh his body is very small and compact um his facial features are very simple very abstracted um and uh he, he is very much this kind of um, not just this comic relief figure like some of the other characters you talked about, but there's there's a there's an element of kind of visual satire right. uh, going on there as well. And he re- um, that he I think rep- is, is really effective. Right. And he represents the ridiculousness that the yes. earth is in at this time. And in fact, speaking of time, this I think takes place in the year twenty nine seventy seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. um uh, it, it, by this point, uh, most people on Earth have become complacent. Uh, they're concerned with petty things. They they don't really consider the seriousness of their situation. And you mentioned the alien invasion. Um, actually, what this alien invasion is at, at the beginning is this, what, large orb that crashes mm-hmm. into the Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... After, I think at one point, the prime minister's reaction to that is, well, it fell on top of my golf course, so why don't we create another golf course around it? You know, And, yes. and they're not considering what that orb is doing to the environment or what it might represent. Um, yeah. But we learn, and I don't think this is a spoiler, later Mm-mm. in the collection uh, that we have um, the aliens – who had already been there for centuries on earth, but Mm -hmm. just no one knew about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It starts to, um, it starts to kind of veer into shades of, uh, like ancient alien stuff. Um, (laughs) which, which, uh, I couldn't help, but, but sort of laugh at when they, you know, there's a scene where they find, uh, a kind of Egyptian pyramid at the bottom of the ocean. Um, or the, um, uh, oh, wow. the the alien language is the same as the the Mayan Inca. language. The Mayan, yeah, I, could, yeah. I, I I couldn't help but but laugh at at stuff like that. Yeah, and, and by the way, this this alien race that is, I guess, the big bad of this series is the Mazon. I guess that's how you mm-hmm. pronounce it. M a z o n. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how I've that's how I was pronouncing it to myself as well. Yeah, um, but we talked about this kind of. And we've talked about the kind of humorous elements of uh, of the series, and and I think that that the kind of goofiness and the jokes are are pretty effective. But um, 
would would you describe the series as a, as a comedy? Because um, I certainly wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. But I I do think it's a quote unquote serious sci fi work with comedic elements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's kind of how I would 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 think about it as well. And I, and I think it's it's interesting to think about this as a kind of product of the the late seventies because I feel like um, in Matsumoto's work, or at least the the kind of small chunk of it that I've seen. Um, as well as some of some of the other titles from the the seventies that we've we've talked about on the show, you do get this kind of blend of a really effective uh, blend, I think, of of humor and seriousness um, that uh, I think is a little absent from from some of the contemporary titles we've talked about. Um, I think there's a there's been a trend towards excising some of those those lighter moments um, in favor of more. Uh, kind of exclusive seriousness. Um, is that something that you've found to be the case as well? Or I, I think so. And an, I think another way of uh, looking at this or framing what you just said is it, asking ourselves, could, I mean, this is something that came out in the 70s. If Captain Harlock, as we have it now, were created today, mm-hmm. would, would it work? Would it be successful? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm. I, I, I'm. I'm not so sure that, at least not in this um, kind of form. I, I. I'm not. I'm not sure that it would. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I don't want to say that Captain Harlock is of its time, but mm-hmm. it is a different kind of manga than the kind that we've been getting today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's certainly the case, and I, I think to maybe maybe a good way of getting into um, maybe what we think of, um, the narrative and, and maybe what narrative elements really stand out to us as, as being very much like products of their time and, and that sort of thing. Maybe a, a good entry point would be to, to maybe raise this question that listeners of the, the show will, will have come to expect. But, um, you know, so we're looking at the first volume of this classic and I think, there's uh going to be just one more um is this a series that you are are kind of interested in 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 seeing to its conclusion i might get the second volume when it comes out mm-hmm. uh i'm mm-hmm. not sure yet uh mm-hmm. but but i did enjoy this first one mm-hmm. now you know oh i'm sorry go ahead oh i was just going to i was going to say there's a you know obviously you're not as enthusiastic about uh as about it as as maybe I'm I am um and so I was gonna gonna ask maybe what about oh I think uh, I, I think I am I, I think I am um I mean I think it's an interesting story in fact um we haven't said much about the story we've talked about some of the characters um maybe maybe going over briefly what happens especially at the outset um mm-hmm. now we already mentioned that this giant black orb. Uh, comes crashing down, embeds itself mm-hmm. in the earth. Um, and so there's a Professor Teba who is trying to figure out what this is about, what to do. He's worried about this. And his son, Tadashi, helps him out. And so they're working on trying to figure out what's going on. And then at one point, this, what looks like a woman in black, uh, appears to the professor, uh, Professor Teba, and touches him, basically kills him. And it's at this, and of course, you know, Tadashi witnesses this, and he's he's shaken. And it's at this point that we're introduced to Captain Harlock. And so Captain Harlock comes and basically destroys this, what appears to be a woman, and we learn to be a Maison. Uh, mm-hmm. And... Uh, later in the later in the collection, we learned that the Maison are a plant based kind of culture, um, but they appear to humans in human form in order to blend in. But when Captain Harlock, I think, what does he? He throws a match at the Maison, mm-hmm. and she turns to what is it? She turns to paper. Is that it? 
so they they keep describing them as the women who burn like paper, and they have a tendency to kind of okay, spontaneously that's it. That's combust. It. Yeah, that's it. And so that's how he gets rid of him. And then uh, Harlock uh, tells Tadashi, uh, you know, who he is. He tells him about being a space pirate, and he has a ship called the Arcadia, and he invites him upon the ship. And throughout, and sometimes in the story there, especially toward the end of this first collection, this is stated outright, Harlock sees Tadashi as a kindred spirit, as Mm -hmm. someone who can be like him. And so that's one of the things that draws Tadashi to Captain Harlock. And so Tadashi goes on the Arcadia. They take a trip. He comes back. Um, he's persecuted by the prime minister and others for going off with his space pirate. And mm-hmm. then Tadashi just decides he's had it with the earth people and their vapidness <laughs> and their non-seriousness. And he wants to go aboard the Arcadia and basically become a space pirate with Harlock. And Harlock tells him, you know, once you make this decision, then that's it. He said, I mean, you can decide later if – you don't want this anymore, and that's fine. But I have to agree <laughs> that you know <laughs> you get to go back to Earth. But anyway, more or less, uh, Tadashi commits himself to Captain Harlock, and then they go off on a sent, uh, series of adventures. And those adventures usually include the Maison and combating the Maison in one form or another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up um, the the relationship between um, Harlock and Tadashi. Um, which is, you know, we've talked about the kind of humorous elements, but in this relationship, um, Matsumoto really teases out some of these kind of philosophical questions. You're right. You mentioned Tadashi is um, kind of inclined to go on this adventure because of his uh, his feelings about the current state of, of the human race and uh, their feelings that, that Harlock sort of shares. Um, what did you make of Matsumoto's sort of... I don't know if we want to call it philosophizing or um, the kind of uh, – for me, that's where the kind of uh, – the the richer thematic elements um, come out of, of the narrative. Um, what, did, what did you make of those? Do you think that Matsumoto does a kind of effective job of, of, um, of kind of dramatizing those um, maybe ideological points of view? Uh, like like what for example i mean like um like captain harlock's um perspective on um individuality and this kind of rugged uh, I see. Um, individualism yeah um, that he's a kind of archetype of yeah i mean he he definitely is a classic romantic hero um and he is going to go out there and assert himself he is his own person he's not flying any under any other national or world flag mm-hmm. uh he does it because he wants to and he's going to go out there and not only fight the maison but right wrongs and mm-hmm. so in certain ways as a pirate he comes across almost as a robin hood figure and i think that works well um, I, I don't think it's philosophically uh, heavy or complex mm-hmm. in any way, the way, you know, his romantic hero mm-hmm. approach mm-hmm. Uh, to his work. But I, I, I thought it was effective in this collection. Yeah, I, I would agree that it's effective. I think, I think I kind of thought about it a little. It, it struck me a little, a little differently than it did you. I was, I, I started to become a little preoccupied with the um, maybe political underpinnings of of Harlock, Harlock as a character and the kind of. Um, uh, I started to see him almost as a kind of um, critique of of. Um, of post-war um, Japanese life in a way. And, uh, uh, you know, this is something we've seen in, in other manga from the 60s and 70s. Um, and I've, you know, you see in uh, some, a lot of in, in, in like 
uh, the movies of the Japanese New Wave by like Seijin Suzuki and, and Nagisa, o, Nagis, Nagisha Oshima, um, you start to see from the perspective of these artists and these filmmakers um, who were kind of growing up in the shadow of, of in the wake of World War II, um, you see this this heavy critique of um, the kind of political turn in Japan at that time. And I, and I started to see Harlock as maybe, um, especially in juxtaposition to that kind of buffoonish prime minister we had seen, um, I started to see him as maybe as maybe a critique of um, of the kind of prevailing post-war um, Japanese attitude. And, and I, I wasn't sure if 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 you picked up on that or you saw that or 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 maybe I just kind of am uh, projecting I, I, onto that. I have to tell you, as I was reading this collection, I didn't think about the cultural political context of Japan at the time. But this makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. What you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know too much about um, about Matsumoto, but, I, you know, from what I understand, he is very concerned with um, these characters like Harlock or in series like um, Space Battleship Yamato. Um, he, he's interested in these kind of militarized characters in a really interesting way. And and I, I wasn't really sure what to make of it. And, and part of that is because I, I haven't read too, too much of, of Matsumoto's work. Um, but I was curious to see if, if maybe um, you were kind of picking up on, on maybe certain attitudes towards um, towards the military or, or, or militarization. And it's not just the militarization. Uh, I think it, it, you know, all of this comes from, let's say, you know, Japan, especially after the 1950s and 60s uh, and the kind of cultural changes that were going on, you know, after the occupation, their association mm -hmm. with uh, the United States, even mm -hmm. after um, being their own person, so to speak. Uh, and so I think that's where this kind of assertive individual assertive individuality of Captain Harlock really comes into play. And that makes sense to me that this in this way is of its time. You know, I said a moment ago, I don't want to say that, uh, you know, aesthetically, artistically, that Captain Harlock is of its time, but I think that maybe culturally, politically, yeah, this, uh, mm -hmm. this book is of its time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't made that connection before, but I do think you're right that, you know, in the sixties and seventies, you, you did start to see, uh, you know, a very, um, vocal push for a kind of Japanese self-determination, um, that I, I think, I think a, a strong argument could be made that Harlock, uh, represents that, that desire for, um, self-determination and, and independence, um, which can, you know, we can relate to, uh, the Japanese desire to kind of shirk off, uh, the yoke of, uh, of, um, their relationship to the, to the United States at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> we're talking about this. It reminds me, and I can't remember what chapter it's in. And I wish I had marked it before we started the discussion, but there's one chapter in particular where Harlock is talking with Tadashi about who he is. And basically he tells him his philosophy mm -hmm. and he talks about, and, and he uses this flowery language to do it. And he keeps repeating certain phrases over and over again, uh, including I am captain Harlock. And he keeps telling you remember what I'm talking about that passage. Uh, um, I wish I had marked it. God, I've been flipping uh, through trying to find it, but it, it goes over several pages. Mm hmm. And he talks about the vast ocean of the sea and, and all oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. the the, the mm -hmm. uh, space and all of that. Um, yeah, it, it it's kind of wild. And in fact, I think up until that point, I was more or less kind of sucked into the narrative mm -hmm. in that – and then at that point, it's like, huh? Mm -hmm. it, it was almost like a pause where – Matsumoto was asserting who Harlick was and his philosophy and his view of space and being a mm -hmm. pirate and all of that. Um, 
but he was doing it, <laughs> I think, uh, overly emphatically. But it, it, it became comedic to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. I think you just you described Harlock as a kind of classic romantic hero. And I think that really comes through in scenes like that or even like, um, uh, you know, the the chapters sort of end and sometimes they'll open with um, these kind of ex expository narrative captions and they're the boxes that they're in are these um, they're drawn to look these like these kind of unfurled scrolls. Um, and I think, I, I think there is a kind of flowery, you said you use this word flowery. There's a kind of flowery flourish to um, a lot of, uh, the, the dramatic moments in the series where there's that little uh, that, that little slight uptick of the curly cue at the end of the the letter, right? This little tiny flourish. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think in certain ways it does be kind, become kind of um, over. It, it's, it's a little over the top um, and that can, that can lead to, to little kind of comedic moments like that. I, I think accidentally, um, I don't think moments like that were intended to be, be funny, but I, I do see how that, that level of, of drama is, can be kind of comedic, but, um, yeah, I do think moments like that is a really good encapsulation of the, the kind of spirit of, of Harlock as a character and, and the, the and this series it, it is, it, it is very, uh, uh I don't want to say baroque because it's not quite at that level of uh, of 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 over the topness, um, but it does have that little that little little extra. Of, yeah, of I, I found one example of that, um, <laughs> uh, and this is on page one fourteen. I will wander to the horizon of the stars. <laughs> People call me Captain Harlock. In the dark ocean of space, in the ocean with no tomorrow, I shall live in freedom until the fire of my eyes burns out. Under my flag, under my flag, I shall live in freedom. <laughs> yes, it's it's very, very dramatic. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I'm wondering if Matsumoto, because I was as I was reading these passages, mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, is Matsumoto being serious or somewhat comedic here, or does some of the comedy come from the translation? And by the way, we haven't mentioned that Zach Davison is the translator mm -hmm. of this collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that raises a really interesting point. I think for moments like that, I'm inclined to say that it's probably Matsumoto being um, sincere. Um, you know, you could maybe quibble with maybe a different translator would pick slightly different words. Um, but I think the, the overall sentiment would remain the same. And, and I think the sentiment is one of, um, uh, you know, based on, again, on, on what, what I know about, um, the little other Matsumoto I have read and, and the other Matsumoto that I'm aware of, I, I, I think he's being in totally, um, sincere in that moment. I think he is uh, writing Harlock as a character who's genuinely um, uh, romantic in that sense, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the kind of capital R romantic um, sense. And I, and I think that's a moment where that that attitude and that ethos um, comes out. And, um, you know, I think it strikes us, especially as um, contemporary readers, it strikes us as a little as maybe a little over the top, a little kind of overly dramatic. Um, right. And that, that might've even been the case for his, um, contemporaneous readers. Um, but I, I do get the sense that, 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 that is Matsumoto being, um, sincere. Yeah. I, I got the same impression. So I, I, but I think that it represents not only the way that let's say Harlock talks at times, but mm -hmm. also his character. In mm -hmm. his philosophy, yes. so yes. It, it kind of underscores that mm -hmm. uh, quite dramatically. But mm -hmm. um, now, yeah. one of the things I'm I'm curious I, because I had an experience reading this collection, and I'm wondering if you had similar feelings. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I thought that the first half, especially, or maybe the first two thirds, I really got into Mm -hmm. and things made sense to me. The last half or the last third of this collection, though, I found myself more confused than otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it wasn't a function of maybe many more moving parts toward the end than we had at the beginning. Um, We, you know, we do have a series of developing complications Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. that I think kind of build as we get toward the end of this collection. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed the first half, especially more than I did the second half. But, you know, I enjoyed the second half well enough, just not as much as the first half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I had a different experience, but we both kind of picked up on similar things. I do think that the first half of the book is a little more straightforward. Um, And I think, like you mentioned, that this is, I think, partially a function of towards the beginning, uh, the narrative is a little more uh, simple, right? You have fewer characters to keep track of. um, You have fewer plot um, machinations to keep track of. Um, What little we know of the antagonist is is pretty simple and straightforward. They're a little mysterious, um, but we haven't yet got into the kind of complexity of their relationship to um, the narrative and to... Um, you know, what their goals are and and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's, uh, I would agree with that description of the the kind of way the the narrative is functioning in the first half versus the the second half. It gets a little more complicated towards the end. Um, you start getting, it, 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 it begins to raise more and more questions as the series goes on. Um, and so there is, uh, a lot left, um, kind of up in the air, especially as, as the book ends. Um, but I do think I, I enjoyed the second half, uh, more than the first half. Um, oh, really, you know, yeah. Like, like, like you said, that's not to say I didn't enjoy the first half. I, 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 I liked it. Um, but I do think, um, I would say even in right in the middle where there's a kind of clear bifurcation of the book, um, it must've been where they combined to, um, smaller volumes uh, where you get that uh, the first kind of couple introductory color pages um, like we do at the beginning of this volume um, right around there. I think that for me was where the narrative um, really started to pick up speed a little bit. And I and I um, began to get really invested in in the kind of plot of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so for me, I, I liked the the way it kind of picked up the pace a little bit in the second half as compared to the first, which, which felt a little, um, a little slower to me. And again, I think that is a, that is a function of it's having to do this work of, of introducing the characters and introducing the world, um, as well as introducing the, the antagonist. Um, but it, it seems like we, we, um, kind of, picked up on the the same things in the first half and in the second half and the differences between them. Um, but it does sound like we had the kind of inverse reaction to them. Yeah. Um, Actually, those color pages that you mentioned, not counting the ones at the very beginning, mm-hmm. um, begin the first, I guess, the last third. It takes place around, mm-hmm. what, 278 and 279. Mm-hmm. And so that's when we we get those. Uh, I thought that was those came a little earlier, but yeah, but right around there is where I'm thinking that it started to kind of um, to to pick up speed a little bit, and, and I also for me it's it's in that kind of back half really um, where uh, where some of my favorite of of Matsumoto's illustrations, um, you know, you get this couple page sequence of the of um, what's the name of the ship, the Arcadia, uh, the Arcadia Harlock yeah. ship. Um, it's like four or five panels of the Arcadia diving. Uh, into the ocean um and it's these very very simple drawings of the ship um but the way they kind of uh play off one another and the uh, the kind of design of the page as a whole i thought was really effective and um those drawings of when they get into this kind of pyramid uh inside the pyramid is is it's it looks kind of like the the neurons of the human brain and um there's some just some really striking images i thought in that that back half and uh so yeah i i I think um yeah i would say that i i I 
had a, had a very different experience than you did, and I I, I liked the uh, the second half um, narratively and um, visually. I think uh, a little more than than the first half. Yeah, um, but I liked both. Vi- visually, I'm I'm with you. I think that the last half, especially last third, last half mm-hmm. of this collection, this first volume. Um, stands out more than what we see toward the beginning. I think another thing that I like more about the f- first half of the collection is this interesting balance between the seriousness and the comedic. Mm-hmm. And I did appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And you yeah, don't I, get you don't get that after let's say the second you know after like halfway through. You know um, a, you know a good bit of the comedy is lost. Yeah, I, I do think that's a good point that the kind of there is a slight tonal change um i well i say slight i i I agree with you that there is a that there's far less humor in the second half um but the the shift itself is very it occurs very subtly um and yeah there's something to be said for the 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 humor in the first half which which like you i i i enjoyed quite a bit um but i think overall um the second half just had more of what I think Matsumoto does really well, um, which I think he's an incredible um, cartoonist. I think he's got a really strong sense of um, the how to lay out a page, and I think he's really good at just drawing. Um, and uh, like I said, I think the narrative really picks up pace for me, and I, I got a lot more invested in it in that second half mm-hmm. um, than in the first. Um, but overall, like I said, and and I, like you said, um, I liked both 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 halves uh, quite a bit. Hmm. Now, early on, you asked me if I was going to go on to read, let's, let's say, the second volume. Well, what about you? Are you going to finish out the the Captain Harlock series? Um, yeah, you know, not only did it uh, did. Did I come away really wanting to read more of this series? Um, but I really wanted to go back and revisit um, Emeraldus and and finish the the couple of volumes of that series that I I hadn't got around to. And it, it it made me really hope that Seven Seas is able to get the license and do translations of of other Matsumoto works because I I, I think the my big big takeaway from this was that I I just absolutely adore. Uh, the way Matsumoto draws, um, mm-hmm. he, the way he draws characters, uh, the way he draws these weird settings, um, his sense of design. Uh, I'm just a huge fan of it. It's it's really enjoyable to to look at and it's really enjoyable to read. Um, so, yeah, e- even if I didn't um, even if I wasn't interested to see how the narrative um, concludes, which I am, um, I would absolutely still be be interested in, in reading more of this series and then more of Matsu, Matsumoto's work in general. Okay, let's move on to the second text that we're going to be looking at this month, and this is Slum Wolf by Tadeo Tsugi. This is coming out, or has just come out, uh, in fact, uh, from New York Review Comics. And this, you know, I, I was I was checking out, and th- this is someone else that we've discussed on the show in the past. You know, you mentioned that with Matsumoto, we discussed Queen Esmeraldas, and then now this Captain Harlock collection. Um, with uh, Tsugi... We discussed Trash Market, if you recall, which mm-hmm. was a drawn in quarterly book, which came, I think, uh, came out in 2015, and we discussed it on our June 2015 show. So it's been a while since we had a uh, Tsugi text, and now we have a second. And as far as I know, this is only the second book of Tsugi's that is available in English. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, as far as I know, that's. That's a correct. He's um, he's a uh, very. Uh, there's very limited amounts of his his work available in English, um, right? And this is translated, and even with an essay by mm-hmm. Ryan Holmberg, um, edited by Ryan Holmberg, and you know both of us really appreciate the work that Holmberg does when it comes to manga and not only his translations and his editing, but also with the, uh, the essays 
that mm-hmm. he inserts, that he writes himself mm-hmm. uh, in many of the collections. Maybe not everything that he does, but in, in some of the ones that he does. And, um, uh, I don't think I've read anything by him where he didn't uh, – I mean, I, he might have. I, I don't – I think there are a couple of his manga translations that I haven't um, been able to to get copies of. But I think he, he does uh, – uh, an essay uh, uh, with with everything, um, and uh, like you mentioned, those are usually good. And he also usually includes, um, or at least he has been including in the last few books he's done, um, prose work from the cartoonists themselves, which I've found really fascinating. Right. Now, you know, the last time we looked at a work that Holmberg edited, it was – a few months ago, Baron mm-hmm. uh, Yoshimoto's mm-hmm. The Troublemakers, and there was a really, really nice essay mm-hmm. in the back of that. Um, did he – I know he edited Red Red Rock. Mm-hmm. Was there an essay in Red Red Rock? I can't recall because we discussed um, that on the show. Yeah, I can't recall. That might have been one of the couple that he didn't um, – and I'm not sure if he did with um, with Flowering Harbor, which is another Hayashi book, which I also think we talked about on the show. Um, but I do th- think that both of those had a prose work by Hayashi, though that I could be misremembering that. But I, I'm not sure if if Holmberg contributed like an essay to those. Hmm. Now, this is a collection of nine stories that appeared originally between 1969 and 1978, and they appeared in such publications, I think primarily Gatto, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Yagyo, and then several others, but um, mostly Gatto. Mm -hmm. And then we have, as you mentioned, the essay by Tsuki himself, Always a Tough Guy at Heart, which I found interesting. And then Holmberg's essay, The Vagabond Zone, which mm-hmm. is a great title given yeah. one of the, the stories, Vagabond Plane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that was my – I was immediately struck by the uh, – um, it, it is, it's just a really good title. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's no other way to say it. It's just a really – it's just a good title. Yes. Now <laughs> – um, I have to say, this is, for me, not only the, a highlight of the month, but a highlight of the year so far when it comes to manga. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think this is... Or uh, one of them, one of the highlights. Yeah, it's it's one of the strongest, uh, not just one of the strongest manga I think we've read this year, but I think it's one of the strongest uh, comics to be released this year. Yeah. Right. You know, I felt the same way about um, the Troublemakers as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would, you know, I've uh, I, I haven't read a, a a book that Holmberg has edited and translated um, that I haven't uh, for the most part, absolutely adored. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's sometimes in some of these anthologies, there are some stories that are stronger than others. Um, but overall, I, every book of his that I've uh, I've read since kind of becoming aware of him a number of years ago when he started doing, um, oh, I think the first one of his I read was the, um, the like avant-garde pop manga adaptation of Last of the Mohicans that Picture Box put out. Oh, um, yeah. ever since then, I have just absolutely adored every single thing that he's been involved in mm. and this is no exception now you mentioned that some stories in in various collections are stronger than others uh now i don't want to ask you what you think your favorite stories are but maybe another way of asking that question would be which ones stand out to you as significant or notable in one form or another um you know, that's really tough. Um, I liked all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think w- one that really stands out to me is Vagabond Plains. First, because it's the longest. It's a two-part story. Um, it's the longest in the book. Um, and also, it's unfinished. Um, so it's a little odd because of that because it does have this um it's a narrative that doesn't conclude 
Um, it's also got some really, really great art. Um, but it is tough, especially with a book like this where Holmberg or not Holmberg, um, Suge is, um, I'm still trying to sit with and think through the kind of organizing logic of the book, because unlike some of the other anthologies that Holmberg has done, and, um, I think most of the anthologies that we, we read on the show and, and I read, um, outside of the show, they tend to be organized uh, chronologically, whereas the, the the stories in this are not organized chronologically. You have um, some stories that are uh, early that come at the very end of the book, some stories that are kind of later chronologically come in the middle, um, and you have these recurring figures and recurring characters that pop up in really interesting ways across a number of these stories. And so it's really difficult for me to think about them as these discrete individual stories because they are so interconnected and they're so interrelated and they, but they're interrelated in ways that I'm still sort of trying to figure out. Um, so I think right now to answer your question Um, I think I'm going to go with Vagabond Plains, (laughs) though I will have a little asterisk there and say that I, I'm having a really difficult time thinking about this as a collection of, of short stories rather than, um, what you have called a short story cycle. This is closer to a cycle than we had with Trash Market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you, you mentioned the recurring characters. I'm also glad that you pointed out that the stories are not necessarily arranged chronologically. I think toward the beginning they are, but then things start to get mixed up because, mm-hmm. you know, the first story, 1969, then 1969 for the second one, and then the next two were published in February of 1971, then uh, 1972, 76, 78. But then with Vagabond Plain, those came out in 75 and 76, and the very last story of the collection, The Death of uh, Ryokichi Ayo. Eogishi came out in December of 1972. Um, and if you recall, we had a similar conversation when we uh, were discussing Yoshimoto's Troublemakers, mm-hmm. uh, that those stories weren't arranged chronologically. And we kind of speculated, what would we have different in this collection? How would it come across differently if things were arranged chronologically. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, these are editorial decisions that Holmberg needed to make, you know, in terms of arranging these stories. Um, But, you know, getting back to another point that you made in terms of the recurring characters that we see uh, over and over again, you know, there is the aforementioned uh, Ryokichi Eogishi, and he is the subject of two stories, The Flight of Ryokichi Eogishi, and then the very last story, The Death of Ryokichi Eogishi. And one of the things that struck me about Eogishi, the character, in both of these stories, they're different. Did you notice? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, a Quite little. Quite different. Quite different. Um one is a salary man in the flight of Ryokichi Aogishi, and then we don't know who the other one is necessarily in the death of Ryokichi Aogishi, although we do know that he's aged and he's living in this area. I th- is he living in the Vagabond Plain area? Um, yeah, that's another thing that I – it's it's unclear um... – where some of these stories take place because you know in vagabond plains like you kind of alluded to you have this uh, establishment of a of a kind of fantastical um makeshift ad hoc community and some of these stories do seem to take place um within that community and kind of on the outskirts of it but it's never really clear um so i sort of got the impression that it was but i I don't think it's ever made explicit. 
Yeah. And um, another reason why I feel that the Aogishi character in these two stories are quite different is that in the first one, the flight of Ryokichi Aogishi, we see his wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is the mention of a child. I don't know if we see the child. But in the death of Ryokichi Aogishi, we learn that Aogishi's wife and child were killed during World War II. Mm -hmm. And so that can't be the case. Uh, that the, the same character, because in that first story, which takes place after World War II, we do see his wife and there's mm -hmm. the mentioning of the child. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting what he's doing there, although, I mean, you could argue for all practical purposes, they're almost the same characters. But there are other characters that we have recurring throughout. And the other two that really stand out, they're Sabu and mm -hmm. Uh, I guess you pronounce his name Ryu, R-Y-U. Yeah, Ryu. Ryu. Um, especially Sabu. And Sabu is the subject of uh, I, at least half, if not most, of the stories. Uh, mm -hmm. We see Sabu in Sentimental Melody. Mm -hmm. We see him in Legend of the Wolf, for certain. Um, Vagabond Plane. Plane. He's a part mm -hmm. of that, yeah. Um, we, he's in um, <sighs> Wandering Wolf. Is he in Wandering Wolf? I know that that's basically Ryu, that's you, Ryu's story. Yeah, see, okay, so this is something maybe we can talk about briefly. Sabu and Ryu are these two recurring characters, but often you have a character who looks like one referred to the – like they – um, there's a character who I thought was Sabu, but then he's referred to as Ryu. And the, there's a character who in one story I thought was Ryu, who's referred to as Sabu. Um, so you have <laughs> very similar, um, you have the, the, the recurrence of the names, but you also have these characters who are drawn very, if not identically, very similarly to characters that they, it's, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it because in one story you have Sabu and Ryu interacting with another. Right. That's one the another. story of uh, the legend of the wolf. Um, yeah. And then in another, I think it's in um, Vagabond Plain, though I could be thinking of a scene in the death of Ryokichi um, Eogishi where a character who I thought was Sabu is referred to as Ryu and the character I thought was Ryu is referred to as Sabu. And so you have this kind of, um, this like, I, I can't help but think it's intentional. This, this like mix up of, of identities in this really interesting way, it, sort of related to what you were talking about with this character of, um, Ryo Kichi, um, who has the same face and the same name, as a as a character from an earlier story, but it looks like a, actually it looks like I thought it looked like a different face. Even oh aged. really? Yeah, uh, even I was, aged. I thought hmm. I I was flipping back to uh, after I was after I got done reading that that final story, the death of Ryokichi Aogishi. I looked back and and um um and I was thinking that uh, they were that they were identical characters. Um, uh, but I mean, visually. Uh, yeah, visually. Mm. Um, but regardless, you have, uh, if not identical characters, you have very, very similar looking characters mm -hmm. with the same name, um, but different kind of backstories, like you mentioned. And so there is, if we're looking at the book as a whole, across the book, you have this interesting play of identity in a, in a way that right. I'm I'm not sure what to make of. Well, there's certain visual markers I found that kind of defined both Sabu and Ryu. For Sabu, for the most part, I think with the exception of Sentimental Melody at the very beginning, the, ver the that's the very first story, mm -hmm. uh, Sabu is defined by his sunglasses, mm -hmm. which he wears day and night. Right. And in fact, in uh, what, Legend of the Wolf, Ryu, when he's talking with Sabu, mentions, or he observes, he says he's wearing sunglasses at night. Um, <laughs> and I, that is not a reference to that, uh, what, 
I can't remember the artist who did that. Is it that old 80s song? Yeah, I can't. Oh, I don't yeah. know who, who, who yeah. sung that either, but I know what you're song, talking about. Yeah, that song annoyed me. But <laughs> um, And then with Ryu, his defining visual feature is his long face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the ways that you could, I guess, mark Ryu throughout the collection. And there's some there's some occasions where the name Ryu is not even used at all. But mm-hmm. you see him. So, for yes. instance, I remember what uh, the, I guess the first time we saw Ryu was in the story that it basically is his Wandering Wolf, the Blood Spattered Code of mm-hmm. Honor and Humanity, which I think was one of the standout stories for me, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and that one was originally uh, appearing in Gatto in 1972. And then that next story, Legend of the Wolf, there is. We do have the Ryu character. His mm-hmm. face doesn't seem as long, but because the name Wolf is in that story, mm-hmm. just as it was in the previous mm-hmm. Wandering Wolf, Wandering Wolf, um, I just assumed that that character was was Ryu. Same thing with, uh, I guess that that following story, Bum Mutt. Mm-hmm. I don't. Yeah. I, I can't remember if Ryu is referred to by name, but it's it's Ryu. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. There's like a a weird sort of implied connection between those stories that I think Suge doesn't ever make explicit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then when we get to Vagabond Plane, there is. Okay, now Vagabond Plane, you mentioned, is kind of a two-parter. There is, I guess, the first story, which is called Vagabond Plane, and then the second quote-unquote story, There, it's Vagabond Plane 1, and then Vagabond Plane 2, and there was going to be a continuation, supposedly, mm-hmm. but it, it never was. It was unfinished, as you mentioned. Um, and I think it's in that second half of Vagabond Plane that we see someone who is an arm wrestler who basically makes money that way. He arm wrestles Mm -hmm. individuals, especially American soldiers, uh, during the occupation. Um, And at first he – there's, I, I, I wondered, is this Ryu? He kind of looks that way, but his face is not as long. And he seems a little bit different or out of context than – from the way we saw him in the earlier stories. But then at one point, one character refers to him as Ryu. So it's like, oh, that's Ryu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, Yeah. So there's moments like that where you get these kind of overlaps of narratives. um, And, and I think part of what maybe contributed to my confusion or disorientation, maybe might be a better way to describe (laughs) it is, Um, You know, we talked about some of these stories. It's unclear where they're set, um, but it's also unclear sometimes when they're set. So you have these stories that are um, they're ordered, um, not chronologically, well, not always chronologically, um, but it's unclear if the um, the narratives themselves, what their chronology is and and because you 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 see references to characters having these relationships with one another but then you kind of see uh that that relationship as it's kind of being built in a in a later story um and so it's it's a really it's a really interesting it's not it's not a straightforward book by any means I think no and a word that you used a second ago indeterminacy I think is important because you know we were talking about it, it, you know this is maybe the closest thing to a cycle that we've seen uh, definitely much more of a cycle than um, let's say trash market. Uh, or let's say uh, the troublemakers that we've mentioned, another Hamburg edited uh, mm-hmm. translated collection. But um, you know, you can have a cycle where you have recurring characters and settings and whatnot, where there are slight variations. 
So it's mm-hmm. repetition with variation. And I think that at times the indeterminacy of the character, both visually and also in terms of character background, you know, I mentioned that uh, with a, a Rigo Kishi, you know, we have two different Rigo Kishi histories, you know, between mm-hmm. the two stories, uh, but that's okay. Uh, they're both apparently the same character. They definitely have the same name. Um, but I think that goes hand in hand with the kind of indeterminacy that you've been mentioning. And that is, where do these play- things take place? What's the mm-hmm. setting? What's the temporal setting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great opportunity for me to a- ask you one of the things that I wanted to ask you when you were first started talking about um, this character or characters uh, if of Ryokichi Aogishi. Um, right at the beginning of the book, he appears in the flight of Ryokichi, and then at the end, he appears in the the death of Ryokichi. And his death is kind of explicit, um, as made clear by the title of that last one. Um, <laughs> but he also appears in this story that follows directly after the flight of Ryokichi called Sounds. And I'm still, I when I first read it, and now I'm convinced that that's a story about Ryokichi having died and kind of wandering through some sort of nebulous representation of the afterlife. Um, and so from my reading, you have the flight of Ryokichi Aogishi, and then you have this story where he is already dead. And then later you get this, you know, this story of the death of Ryokichi Aogishi, um, where he is alive and we see the kind of last, uh, last moments or last days of his life and, and he dies again. Um, is that something that is that I mean that is is that a reading of that story sounds that um, is kind of c- kind of consistent with with how you were reading the story or uh, am I just am I just con- kind of disorienting myself here? <laughs> yeah, um, you know I think what you had just described would be cool if <laughs> we have in sounds the Ryokichi character, which I don't think we do, and. I think that there are enough visual markers of difference between the two characters. Mm. Um, Like, for instance, the face seems to be slightly different, but especially the hair. Because we get in the flight of Ryokichi Aogishi, he has black hair. And it, it's a, it's of a particular style. And then in sounds, we get someone with lighter hair with a different style. So I didn't see them as the same person. Mm. But again, it comes back to something that we've mentioned, that even if he's not dealing with the same character, he's dealing with uh, – uh, Tasugi is dealing with certain, let's say – visual markers and using them again and again with variation Mm -hmm. among all of his stories, just as he's using characters sometimes with some variation across many of the stories in this collection. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I, I think, I think, you know, I mentioned just maybe we could describe this collection as a, as a short story cycle. And I like the idea of that because Throughout these stories, regardless of of whether or not these are the same characters or that they have a kind of or they're um, different versions of the same characters uh, or there's like a coherent um, timeline or or anything like that, it's clear that Suge is interested in exploring certain questions – Mm-hmm. Again and again, and he's interested in in exploring them through um, f- these very specific uh, character types, right? These types of people, these people who have these very particular relationships to um, others, um, and he's interested in, in returning to those relationships and the kind of nature of those relationships again and again to explore um, certain ideas and and certain moods, certain feelings, um, and to express, uh, I think, a, a certain uh, zeitgeist of when he's working, if we want to call it that. Right. And one story that we haven't even mentioned yet uh, in this collection is Punk, which comes mm-hmm. after Sounds. And in Punk, we don't get 
any of the characters that I can discern that we've been discussing, right, that that seem to recur over and over again, but the kind of individual that we have in the protagonist, because basically it's a guy and a woman, his girlfriend, and it's basically them kind of meandering, going from one thing to another, and, and they're basically described as punks, right? Mm-hmm. They're troublemakers in some ways. Um even though I think this is in many ways a quote unquote standalone story compared to most of the others in this collection, um, the kind of character that our protagonists are is not entirely different from what we see with Sabu and Ryu. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Again, I, again, that's that attitude with variation, right? right. I, I think. And I think that is a, a good kind of, um, I think, a particularly um, pronounced example of what we're talking about. And um, and, and you might have felt this way. Um, I certainly felt this way. It's it's the same sort of um, person uh, that um, Suge kind of. Uh, rendered in the stories collected in trash market right Mm. he's really interested in looking at these youthful characters who are suffering from certain material depredations who are living through a certain cultural shift um, who are living under the shadow of um, american occupation um and he's interested in really examining like what is life for some for a young Japanese man who is um, kind of living in the exurbs or in uh, rur- in the rurality, who is poor, who is kind of desperate, who just kind of wants to have a good time, um, who is living through um, a change in cultural epoch, um, and who is kind of resentful of the presence of certain. Um, people in 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 his community, um, and I think that's the the kind of person that Suge, at least in the stories that that Holmberg has translated in these two books, that's the sort of person that Suge is is really interested in 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 um, training our our eye on. Did he do the translation of Trash Market? Um, I. No, he edited it, and I okay. believe he. Well, he I believe he, he edited it. Then he. Almost certainly, sure. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Good point that you made. Okay, one thing before we, I guess, leave uh, Slum Wolf that I wanted to mention. Now we've been calling this a story cycle. Um, in a way, I kind of hesitate in labeling it that way, and this for this reason because these are stories that were published elsewhere. Right. And then collected here by Holmberg, the editor, and Mm -hmm. he chose what to include and what not Mm -hmm. to include. Mm -hmm. And as Holmberg mentions in his essay at the very end, he says, there there are many other (laughs) stories that I could (laughs) include. Instead of this being a 300-page collection, uh, if I included even more stories, then it could be 500. So Mm -hmm. because this wasn't intentionally on on Tsuge's part, mm-hmm. uh, a, a series that he collected, right. then, you know, I, I don't think we could call it a st- short story collection. On the other hand, he's working in a completely different medium than the book form, right? Mm-hmm. With these mm-hmm. stories, because he's, he's publishing these in a variety of different magazines and whatnot. Um, and sometimes standalone publications. So, but what he's doing among his various stories that he's publishing in Gatto, so on and so forth, uh, is similar to what an author who sits down to intentionally write uh, a short story co- uh, cycle in book form. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do think that's a good point, that there is a kind of key difference in when we tend to talk about short story cycles, um, the kind of work being done um, – or uh, the 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 goal being aspired to by the author is, is slightly different, um, mm. and so maybe maybe that's not the most precise way to think about it. But um, I think for me, it, it's useful to think about it in that sort of framework as a sort of um, the way that the stories are related to one another in right. 
something like a short story cycle is how I right. saw them being kind of connected yeah. um, in this collection. Yeah, there's definitely some kind of cycling going on here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, two really fascinating books yeah. that we looked at this month. We started off with Liji Matsumoto's Captain Harlock Classic Collection, Volume 1, which came out in June from Seven Seas Entertainment. And then after that, we looked at Teiru Tsugi's Slum Wolf, New York Review Comics, just came out just a few days ago, in fact. Mm. So two great books. Yeah. I enjoyed discussing them. Yeah, I enjoyed discussing them. I enjoyed reading them. And um, at least for uh, uh, Captain Harlock, I'm going to probably enjoy uh, reading the next volume. Yeah, and and I just might as well. Mm -hmm. And if you want to find great manga like the kind that Shay and I discuss every month, then definitely head on over to the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to DCB, dcbservice.com, you'll find a ton o manga every month at unbeatable prices. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your manga there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can contact us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. You can also email us uh, if you want to email the show. You can email us at two guys at comicsalternative.com. Um, if you want to email me directly, you can email me at shay at comicsalternative.com. And Derek, why don't you tell the fine listeners what your email address is? Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcast. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and commentary that we occasionally post on the blog, simply by going to the website, comicsalternative.com. So a fun month of reading, and I look forward to September show. I always look forward to the next show. That's right. So until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. Take care.